thank you to the organizers and in particular to Professor Del Isola for inviting me here and giving me this opportunity. It's a great honor to speak here. Uh, and I would like to talk about uh, geodesics on GL3 and nonlinear elasticity. Uh, wait a second. Get this out of the way. Um, so this is about uh, some work done by Professor Neff and Dumitra Giva and Johannes Lankheit and myself at the University of Duisburg-Essen. Um, <coughs> the title is a little vague. Um, what I actually want to talk about uh, are some geodesic distance measures on the, on the general linear group uh, and their connection to certain strain measures and uh, the non-linear non <coughs> uh, Henke strain energy in particular. So I begin with some basic definitions and the general setting of elasticity theory. Uh, we have some uh, body omega in some kind of reference configuration, uh, modeled as a bounded domain in Rn. <coughs> uh, we have a mapping of omega to Rn called the deformation mapping, uh, which simply maps a point x to its position uh, in the deformed configuration phi of x. Uh, we can decompose phi of x into x plus u of x, uh, we call u the displacement and the gradient of u the displacement gradient. <coughs> uh, we also use some, some short notation. Uh, the deformation gradient will usually just be called f. Uh, we use the notation u and v for the right and left BO stretch tensor, uh, which are symmetric positive definite factors appearing in uh, the polar decomposition of f. f can be written as... Uh, can be factorized into a pure rotation, R, and uh, some positive definite symmetric uh, matrix. Uh, and the squares of U and V are called C and B, which are the right Cauchy Green deformation tensor and the finger tensor. <coughs> uh, we also write epsilon for the symmetric part of the displacement gradient, which is simply the infinitesimal strain or the linearized strain from uh, linear elasticity theory. Uh, okay, so. Extremely important in the theory of elasticity is the concept of strain. Uh, the idea behind strain is uh, to measure only the non-rotational part of the deformation gradient. <coughs> so, for example, a material strain tensor uh, is simply a mapping from, from U, from the right BO stretch tensor, into the symmetric matrices, uh, so that uh, the strain tensor is coaxial to U. Uh, and vanishes if and only if u is the identity, which is the case if and only if f is a pure rotation. So in some way, the strain tensor is only the non-rotational part of f. Do you have translations? Uh, excuse me? Um, Do you have translations as well? Uh, the translational part is lost uh, since uh, f is the, um, uh, only the gradient, so... The translational part is, is already lost. Uh, but of course, we um, want this to vanish if and only if uh, it's a rigid body movement, so a translation and a rotation. But uh, we lose the, the translation by the gradient, and uh, the rotation uh, should yield zero. <coughs> uh, we also use the term strain measure. Uh, a strain measure is simply a negative number associated uh, with you, uh, with, with, uh, with some deformation gradient, uh, and it should. That's just a general idea. Measure how much the deformation gradient deviates from a pure rotation. Um, so that's the, the basic idea behind strain. Um, and of course, this is closely uh, related uh, to the concept of energy functions. Um, uh, in the most simple case, uh, the, the most simple energy is, of course, uh, this quadratic one, which correlates to um, the, the case of linear elasticity. We simply have two parameters uh, called the shear and the bulk modulus. Uh, and it's pretty much only a, a weighted Frobenius norm of, of epsilon of the um, uh, infinitesimal strain tensor. Uh, we split into the deviatoric and the trace part. The deviatoric part is just the projection onto the trace-free matrices. Uh, and it's a, a squared weighted norm of epsilon. Uh, and for isotropic elasticity, this is the only form in linearized elasticity that the energy can take. So um, there aren't much possibilities. However, in the nonlinear uh, case, there's a very large number of different energies. Um, we can. Um, so this is the, um, the most basic definition of an energy function in the nonlinear case. Um, 
in energy function should be invariant on the left and right uh, application of rotations. So this should hold for all Q in SON. Um, and again, it should be zero if and only if F is a pure rotation. And uh, it will be more precise to call it an energy density. The energy of a whole, uh, a whole deformation phi is simply the integral over the energy density of the deformation gradient. <coughs> Usually there are, some, there are some additional requirements. Uh, not every every function uh, satisfying these properties is, an, is a proper energy function uh, in the physical sense. Uh, we should have some smoothness, uh, of course compatibility with the linear case um, for small deformations. Uh, maybe some uh, constitutive inequalities or convexity conditions or something like that. But this is uh, the most basic definition of an energy function. Like I said, there are many different energy functions which were proposed. Uh, the, the compatibility? Uh, it's simply that uh, if we have uh, small, small f, um, if f is close to the identity, uh, so that um, the displacement gradient is very small, uh, it should be approximated by the linear energy. So these are just some examples of energy functions. Uh, uh, very, very commonly used ones, the neo hook model or the muni rivlin or Otten energy. Um, and in the difference between an energy function and a strain measure, first of all, is that uh, an energy function uh, has some, some kind of physical uh, immediate interpretation. Um, it's simply the um, potential energy inside a, an elastically deformed body. Um, so if we know what this energy function is, or if we um, uh, simply claim that an energy function should be used for a model, uh, then we obtain a whole uh, constitutive model of elasticity for one energy function. For example, if we take the, these energies, uh, we can deduce the stress response curve, uh, in this case for, for uniaxial deformations and for a certain set of parameters. Uh, the whole behavior of the whole physical behavior of the model is determined by this energy function. <coughs> um, the energy function that we're interested in, uh, as I said before, is mostly the isotropic Henke energy uh, introduced by Heinrich Henke in 1929. Um, it looks very much like the, the linear model, um, like the linear energy. We simply replace epsilon, the linear strain tensor with log u, uh, which is the principal logarithm of the right real stretch tensor, uh, which is also called the Henke strain or the, the true strain tensor. Uh, again, we only have two parameters, like in the linear case. Um, and uh, yeah, the Henke strain energy has uh, some very good properties. Uh, first and foremost, uh, it's a very, very good fit to experimental data for up to moderately large strains. Uh, so around 20 to 40 percent elongation, for example, of uh, some rubber-like materials. Um, the, the experimental measurements uh, are a very good fit uh, to, uh, to the response curve, which is deduced from the, the Henke energy. Uh, for larger deformations, however, it's not a very good fit. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Uh, the Henke energy also fulfills some constitutive inequalities, for example, Hill's inequality, the baker erickson inequality. Uh, it uses only two constants, which are the same as in the linear case. Uh, so it's very simple for a new um, material to obtain these, these material parameters uh, by simply measuring, for, uh, measuring in a very small range the deformations and the appearing stresses. Um, and then you have the, the whole constitutive model for this material, uh, which, which is a very good fit uh, then for even larger deformations. <coughs> there are, of course, also some drawbacks, uh, mostly in uh, mathematical nature. Uh, the Henke energy is very difficult to handle. Um, it's not polyconvex and not quasar convex, which was uh, shown by uh, Professor Neff in his PhD thesis, actually. Um, it's not even Legendre Hadamard elliptic, uh, which is necessary, a necessary condition for those convexity uh, properties. Uh, furthermore, it has only subquadratic growth for large deformations. Uh, even worse, there is no Q coercivity whatsoever. Um, there is no Q such that the Henke energy is Q coercive for large deformations. Um, and since uh, 
well, pretty much all uh, existence results for the existence of uh, energy minimizers for certain uh, boundary value problems uh, are based on some kind of convexity and coercivity. Uh, there are no strong existence results known for the Henke energy. So from a mathematical perspective, it's a very difficult kind of energy function. By existence result, you mean minimization problem? Uh, The, the, the energy minimization existence, of course. Um, so we have some, some boundary value problem, and you are looking for the deformation uh, which minimizes the elastic energy. Okay, so uh, back to, excuse me, um, to the more general case. Um, so now what's the difference uh, or the similarity between energy functions and strain measures? Um, the, Okay. Uh, so the similarities are, uh, of course, um, there should be zero if and only if f is uh, pure rotation. And in some way they, they measure the distance or the deviation from f to the set of pure rotations. It should be zero if and only if it is a pure rotation. It measures the uh, non-rotational part. So there's a certain similarity between those two concepts. Uh, however, as I said before, uh, the energy functions have a, an immediate physical meaning, a physical application. And a strain measure is simply uh, some mathematical way of, of measuring this deviation. Um, Okay, so uh, if we wanted to characterize uh, at least a strain measure, maybe even an energy function, as some kind of distance of f to the set of rotations, which from a mathematical perspective it simply is, uh, then the question reduces to the question which uh, distance function we should use on a set of matrices. Um, so for example, uh, we consider the linear case. Um, where we have uh, phi decomposed into x plus u of x. Uh, and we want to, in some, in some kind of way, measure the distance of uh, u, the displacement uh, gradient, uh, the gradient of u, uh, to the set of rotations, which in the linearized case is simply the set of infinitesimal rotations. Uh, if we are close to the identity, we can simply take the tangent space of SON at the identity the linearized approximation of the set of rotations, uh, and that is simply the set of all skew-symmetric matrices in R n by n. Uh, so now what is the, the distance between the displacement gradient and the set of linearized rotations? Uh, well, that depends on what kind of distance measure we use on the set. Uh, the simplest one would, of course, be some kind of Euclidean distance. We have a norm, for example, the uh, canonical Frobenius norm. Um, And then, of course, we have a distance measure by simply taking the norm of the difference. Uh, since the Frobenius norm can easily be decomposed into the deviatoric and the trace part, <coughs> excuse me, uh, we can also use the weighted Frobenius norm uh, simply by putting some, some weight factors in front of these two uh, uh, parts, the deviatoric and the trace part, are weighted in a different way. Um, and then we can simply take the Euclidean distance as the weighted norm of the difference between two points, between two matrices. Uh, so with this distance, what is the distance between the gradient of U and the set of infinitesimal rotations? Uh, well, it's simply uh, the weighted norm of the symmetric part of the displacement gradient, uh, which is exactly the... If we square it, we exactly get the isotropic elastic energy. Um, It's easy to see that this is actually the distance. Uh, SON, small SON, the set of infinitesimal rotations is a linear space. So if we have this displacement gradient here, uh, the element of best approximation is simply the orthogonal projection, uh, and the difference, the remaining part is the symmetric part, uh, and the difference is the norm of the symmetric part of, of the infinitesimal strain. Um, So now uh, we move on to, to nonlinear elasticity, and we would like to use the same method uh, to obtain some kind of strain measure. Uh, so we want to, uh, in this uh, case, of course, measure the distance between the actual deformation gradient F uh, to the actual uh, set of rotations SON. Uh, F is always in, in GL plus N, the set of or the general linear group, uh, set of invertible matrices with uh, positive determinants. Uh, so what kind of distance measure do we use to, to get this uh, distance? Uh, we could try the Euclidean distance again, simply. Um, what do we get? Uh, we have this minimization problem right here. Uh, 
uh, which we have to solve. Um, and what we obtain is that uh, the um, polar factor, the, uh, the orthogonal polar factor, is the element of best approximation, and the distance is simply this, u minus identity in the Frobenius norm squared. Uh, this was actually shown by uh, Giuseppe Grioli in 1940. Um, this minimization problem right here, uh, we considered this problem, solved it, uh, showed that the unitary, or the, the orthogonal polar factor is the, ele the element of less approximation. Um, so, again, if we, if we square this, this measure, this distance that we get, uh, this time we obtain this term here. Uh, simply the norm of the BO strain tensor squared, which is kind of similar to the St. Venor Kirchhoff energy, uh, which is the green Lagrangian strain tensor in the norm, in the weighted norm squared. Uh, but it's not a very good energy function, and this is in fact not a very good measure of strain. Uh, why not? Uh, there are a number of reasons, but for example, uh, if f tends to zero or to some, uh, uh, some singular uh, matrix, uh, the strain measure remains uh, finite. So we actually have uh, a, finite, uh, a finite measure of uh, an infinite compression. And that is pretty much nonsense. Uh, so it's, it's not an, an accurate, not a proper measure of strain, in our opinion. Um, so we probably should use another distance function on GL+. Plus. Uh, now again, um, we only have uh, deformation gradients in GL plus N. Uh, but uh, the Euclidean distance is not an, an intrinsic distance on this set, on this group. Uh, for a number of reasons, for example, um, this, this norm that we evaluate here to measure this distance uh, depends on some kind of difference between uh, two points. Uh, this difference is usually not in the general linear group, so um, yeah, this, this distance function relies on the underlying linear structure of the, the whole metric space. Um, Furthermore, we can't simply uh, measure this distance as the length of the connecting line, at least not in GL+, plus, since the connecting line usually also doesn't lie in GL+. Plus. Uh, there are also a number of more reasons why this Euclidean distance isn't really compatible with um, GL+, plus, uh, which is not uh, a linear space, but some kind of group structure. Uh, so what we are trying to find is instead of this extrinsic distance measure, some kind of intrinsic distance on the set. Um, so this is uh, some purely intuitive sketch. Uh, of course, so, so, um, GL plus N is of course not really a sphere. For example, it's not compact, uh, but simply to show that uh, it's not a linear space, but something, some manifold with a certain structure. Uh, this is the representation of GL plus. Uh, just to show, for example, that if you have some point F uh, and you have the sub-manifold SON, um, then you shouldn't measure the distance uh, by a straight line. That's just not uh, the right measure of distance on this set. Um, so what should we use instead? Um, of course, since uh, GL plus N is simply a manifold or um, a Lie group, uh, we can equip it with a Riemannian metric. And that can then be used uh, to measure some kind of geodesic distance. Uh, so from a mathematical point of view, it's uh, very easy to use a so-called left invariant metric. Uh, what that means is uh, for a Riemannian metric, we have to define some uh, inner product on each tangent space. Uh, and the left invariant metric simply defines one fixed product on the tangent space at the identity and then transforms all other tangent spaces into this tangent space. Uh, I have a picture for that. Uh, so we have some point A uh, and the tangent space at A. And a left invariant metric uh, simply applies the inverse of, of A uh, to the tangent and transforms it into the tangent space at the identity where we have then, then some, uh, some fixed inner product uh, which generates in this way the, uh, the whole Riemannian metric on the whole set. Um, again, uh, so uh, we also call this tangent space at the identity small GLN, uh, which is simply the space of all matrices. Um, if we have a Riemannian metric, we can measure the length of a curve simply by this term here, uh, similar to the Euclidean case. And we can also finally define the geodesic distance between two points P and F, which is simply the, the infimum over the length of all curves uh, inside this manifold connecting P and F. 
Um, okay, so maybe a few more words to the left invariant. Uh, from a mathematical point of view, it's uh, just um, this definition uh, has some kind of simplicity. It's a very easy way to define a Riemannian metric. Um, so what is the, the, the physical interpretation of this invariance? Um, well, what we are trying to measure with this, this distance measure on GL plus uh, is the distance between two deformations. So how much do two given deformations differ? Uh, and if we have some configuration omega and some different configuration phi of omega, uh, we can measure the distance. And if we now apply the same linear um, deformation again to omega and to phi of omega, then we can measure the distance between the two resulting configurations. And the left invariant means, uh, left invariant means that these two distances are actually the same. This is the requirement of left invariance. Uh, so if we apply the same, the same linear deformation to two bodies, how much they differ shouldn't change. That's the idea behind uh, the left invariance. Um, we also require right O n invariance, uh, which is simply uh, because of the isotropy. Uh, we want some, some isotropic uh, measure, uh, measurement. <coughs> uh, so now for, um, uh, if, if for left invariant and right O n invariant uh, Riemannian metrics, uh, we can actually uh, we actually know how, how this inner product on the tangent space at the identity looks like. And it's always given by three parameters, um, mu, kappa, and mu c. Mu c, uh, we call the spin modulus. Um, and it's actually a decomposition similar to the, the norm decomposition, uh, which we have seen earlier. Um, again, we split into the trace and the deviatoric part, but this time we also split the deviatoric part into its symmetric and skew-symmetric part. Uh, so we get one additional parameter for this new symmetric part, and again, we call this the spin modulus. Uh, maybe I'll explain later uh, why. Um, and so uh, our Riemannian metric, that's uh, a little out of bounds here, um, is uh, simply given by this, this inner product, uh, evaluated for the, uh, um, the transformation of uh, two tangents x and y to uh, the tangent space at the identity. Um, okay, so now uh, we have the, the geodesic distance uh, measure well defined uh, <coughs> for those uh, left GL, right ON invariant Riemannian metrics. Um, and what this looks like in the intuitive sketch would be uh, we no longer simply measure the direct connecting line, but the shortest connecting curve um, between F and SON. Uh, the sketch already uh, implies that the polar factor is again the, the element of best approximation, which we don't know yet. Uh, we know neither the distance uh, to this point at least, uh, nor the, the element of best approximation, but it turns out that it is actually the polar factor, so the sketch is correct. Um, so now, uh, how do we measure, or how do we compute this distance? Um, well, uh, of course they're called uh, geodesic distances for, for a reason. Um, it's defined as the infimum over the length of all curves uh, connecting two points. But from a general uh, theorem called hopf theorem, theorem, uh, in, um, uh, in differential geometry, we know that there's always, uh, for geodesically complete spaces, which GL plus N is, um, there's always the shortest connecting geodesic. Uh, so this infimum is actually a minimum. The infimum over the length of curves is a minimum. It's attained by a connecting geodesic curve. Um, and what we know is how the geodesic curves uh, on GL plus N with such a metric look like. Uh, um, so we've shown that they all uh, have this representation uh, based on a result by Mielke, uh, who considered S, uh, SLN as a, as a manifold uh, for some... Um, uh, considerations of plasticity theory. Uh, so we expanded it simply to GL plus N and uh, all geodesics starting in a point F are given by this form. Uh, they all, all take this form for some psi uh, in GLN, uh, the, the set of all matrices. <coughs> uh, 
So another problem is we want, uh, what we have to do now is uh, to find the minimum over the length of all curves connecting F and P, uh, of, of all um, geodesic curves connecting F and P. But although we know that all geodesic curves that start in F look like this, with the initial tangent psi, um, and we know what the, the end point, of course, is, uh, the evaluation of this at, the, uh, at t equals 1. Um, we don't know how to solve for psi. Uh, there's no known closed form solution uh, to this, this equation here, uh, where we can, for given f and p, simply compute the initial tangential direction psi. Um, so, okay, we know how, what the geodesics look like, but we don't know which geodesics uh, actually connect to points f and p. Um, and that makes it impossible to actually compute the geodesic distance of two given, two given points. Uh, we simply cannot do that. Up, until now, uh, we, we still don't know how to do that. Um, but what we can do is use these two formulas um, to uh, give a lower bound uh, on the distance to the whole set SON. Uh, so after some computations, uh, we obtain this right here, uh, the minimum over all logarithm, logarithm, <coughs> sorry, logarithms uh, of QF, uh, the minimum over all Q in SON, um, in the weighted Frobenius norm squared, uh, is a lower bound for the square of the geodesic distance of F to SON. Uh, and we also can simply obtain an upper bound, we insert... Uh, one, one rotation here, uh, the polar factor. Um, we take one curve connecting it to F, uh, measure its length, and then we, of course, have an upper bound uh, for the geodesic distance of F to SON. Um, and what we obtain by simply taking the polar factor and a certain curve um, is this, which is, uh, okay, so it's uh, the distance squared, uh, um, and that is actually simply the Henke strain energy. Uh, so to show what we are trying to show that this distance of F to SON squared is exactly the Henke strain energy. Uh, what remains to do is to show that this minimum right here is equal to this, to the Henke strain energy. Then we know that the upper bound is equal to the lower bound, and therefore uh, they are both um, <coughs> the geodesic distance. And uh, we have just the right theorem for that, uh, shown by... Um, Neff, Birsam, at, uh, and Lankheit um, in 2013, um, which simply states that this minimization problem right here has uh, this minimum as a solution, uh, the, the Henke strain energy, um, and that uh, the element of best approximation, the minimizing element, uh, uh, the minimizing argument now in this minimization problem is the polar factor of F. So we obtain the, the main result, um, the geodesic distance of F to SON in this Riemannian uh, geodesic distance is actually simply, if we square it, uh, is simply uh, the Henke strain energy, which also does not depend on, uh, depend on mu C, on the third parameter. Um, uh, so no matter how, how we choose mu C, we can even set mu C to zero. Um, and we still get this get this distance. <clears throat> okay, so uh, once again, this uh, this intuitive sketch of uh, GL plus n. <clears throat> now we know that uh, R is indeed the uh, the polar factor of F is in fact uh, the the element of closest approximation. The geodesic distance, the length of the shortest connecting curve, uh, is the Henke strain energy. <clears throat> Um, we can also uh, once more draw this uh, Euclidean distance right here, and we can also see that it's very compatible uh, to the linear strain measure that we discussed. Um, if we take this uh, tangent space at the identity, and uh, if f uh, varies only only um, uh, uh, only a little from from the identity, uh, then we can consider the displacement gradient again and work on the, ten, uh, on the tangent space. Again, take the distance to the tangent space of the set of rotations, and of course we uh, just get the linear case again. So it's uh, in, in some way backwards compatible to, um, to the linearized case. 
We also obtain some corollaries. Uh, this is maybe the most important one. Um, not only can we uh, characterize the Henke strain energy in such a way, uh, we can only uh, we can al also uh, characterize those two uh, quantities that appear in the energy separately as geodesic distances. Uh, distances. Um, the deviatory part of log u as a distance on SLN, and uh, the trace of the logarithm, which is the logarithm of the determinant of u, uh, as a geodesic distance on this set, on this Lie group R plus times the identity matrix. <coughs> and so, um, what we have actually done is uh, we have found uh, some um, some purely geometric characterizations of these two quantities. So we could say that, uh, that these two quantities are simple uh, geometric properties, uh, some kind of intrinsic uh, properties of a deformation gradient F. Uh, now what can we do with this result? Uh, well, if this is actually a good measure of strain, then if we now get back to the concept of energy functions, it should be possible uh, to find some kind of energy function uh, which is well behaved in a mathematical sense as well as uh, physically applicable, uh, which only depends on these two quantities. Uh, so uh, what we have seen earlier, um, uh, if, if we take psi, this, this uh, function depending on these two quantities, uh, to be simply the weighted sum of squares, then we obtain the classical Henke energy. Uh, as we have seen in the linear case, uh, to get from, from this distance measure, uh, from this natural distance measure to the energy, we simply take the square or the weighted square of the arguments. Uh, but of course, we could also uh, choose something completely different for psi. Um, and what we also know, um, some questions? Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, if psi uh, Approximates uh, this this weighted square of uh, of uh, weighted sum of squares, um, then we know that the energy, uh, at least in in the range where this approximation holds, maybe for for some small a and b, uh, then the energy of course approximates uh, the Henke strain energy. And since for small deformations the Henke strain energy uh, gives us very good uh, results with um, uh, in comparison with the the experimental data. Um, we should, uh, or we might be able to find some energy function which, for small deformations, is similar to uh, the Henke energy, but for larger deformations, uh, might behave differently. And uh, okay, no, I mean this uh, 91 is not. Uh, that's not really accurate. Uh, <laughs> also, that was not uh, some people were talking about. Uh, no, there are some some 40 uh, 30 backs. Uh, uh, Backup slides. Uh, I don't want to go through 91 slides. Don't worry. <laughs> I'm almost done, actually. Um, so, uh, okay, um, let's talk about some some larger deformations. Uh, I'll hurry up a bit. Um, these are some um, empirical measurements done by Trelua in 1944 uh, for the uniaxial deformation of vulcanized rubber. Um, so um, we stretch. Uh, uh, some piece of, of rubber, um, of organized rubber, uh, up to seven times its original length. Uh, and these are the measurements for the force necessary to do so. Um, and as we can see, some energy models, uh, for example, the octan energy is very accurate uh, for the right choice of parameters, while the Henke energy, it's a little difficult to see, is very, very accurate uh, for smaller deformations, but gets really inaccurate at around this point. So. Um, uh, at around uh, two, two times the original length of the specimen, uh, the Henke energy loses its accuracy. So we might be able to find some energy function which approximates the Henke energy here, but behaves differently or even better in, uh, for larger deformations. Uh, and what we propose, uh, and what we call the exponentiated Henke energy function, um, is this. Instead of uh, taking the weighted sum of squares, uh, we take the weighted sum of uh, the exponential of the squares of these two measurements of these two arguments, um, which for small deformations, of course, uh, simply approximates a sum of squares. So up to 1.2 or 1.4, uh, the original length. Yet, uh, so um, 
in the, in the uni-axial case, at least, the one-dimensional case, it's a very close approximation to the Henke energy. But for larger, for larger deformations, it varies largely uh, based on the additional, uh, additional coefficients we introduced. Um, okay, so it turns out that the exponentiated Henke energy at least in, in this uni-axial case, is uh, very, very accurate. Uh, these are the actual measurements, um, and uh, we see that this, this effect of strain uh, softening at first and strain hardening at a certain, uh, a certain length, um, so negative curvature here, positive curvature here, is very accurately modeled by the exponentiated Henke energy, while the classical Henke energy uh, doesn't behave in this kind of way at all. Um, so we actually, for larger deformations, have, at least in this case, uh, some better results than the uh, original Henke energy. Uh, we also have some uh, nicer mathematical uh, properties. Um, as we have shown, uh, and some of this is still work in progress, uh, um, I think for, for polyconvexity there should be uh, an archive preprint available by now. Um, so in the two-dimensional case, uh, the exponentiated Henke, uh, Henke energy is actually uh, polyconvex. Uh, sadly, it's not polyconvex for the three-dimensional case, uh, but for planar elasticity, um, we can combine it with this result. The exponentiated Henke energy is coercive for all Q, Q coercive. Um, we can immediately, uh, for a large number of, uh, of boundary value problems, uh, see that there is a minimizing, uh, exists a minimizer we have for the boundary value problem, one deformation with um, minimal energy if we use the exponentiated Henke energy, which we cannot obtain for the classical Henke energy. Um, some more properties, uh, it fulfills some uh, uh, constitutive inequalities, the baker erickson inequality, tension extension. Um, what we are trying to do next is uh, find some more empirical data and uh, try to fit the parameters um, and look at how, um, how well we can describe actual measurements with this new constitutive model. Um, we haven't done very much yet, uh, apart from this uni-axial case, but it looks very promising up to now. <coughs> Do I have uh, more time, or um, is it...? <laughs> so you tell me. Uh, uh, okay, so um, <coughs> then I uh, simply skip the last part. Um, okay, so... Uh, some, some open problems. Uh, one of those problems, uh, sadly, I, I skipped, uh, which was on the geodesic convexity of SOM. Uh, but um, we would also like to, to find a similar characterization of the anisotropic uh, Henke strain energy. Of course, there we would need some anisotropic uh, Riemannian metric as well. Um, <coughs> Uh, maybe now that we know of this characterization of the quadratic Henke strain energy, we could also uh, reconsider the question of well-posedness, so maybe um, the existence uh, can be deduced in some way um, by this characterization, for example, uh, by some, some geodesic convexity properties, but uh, instead of classical convexity properties, but we don't uh, really know that yet, um, we haven't really looked into that. Okay, so that's it, so thank you very much for your attention. stress from the energy function, uh, do you mean? Or, uh, okay, um, that's why, what the backup slides are for, actually. Uh, <laughs> um, there are just some, some general formula. Uh, if we have the energy, uh, we simply ex uh, obtain the, the stress tensors by some, some computation. Uh, the, um, 
the first Piola Kirchhoff uh, stress is actually, per definition um, of the energy function, uh, the derivation of uh, the energy uh, by F. So, um, as in the, the linear case, or uh, what, what was the question? It's, uh, it's non linear, of course. Uh, so we Why do you, you keep the same definition uh, Of course, the, the same, uh, the, the usual definition in non linear elasticity uh, for how you get from an energy to, to a stress. Uh, so we simply use, no, no, there's no change there. Uh, we simply use the, the classical framework. Uh, we just change the energy function. Uh, uh, yeah? Uh, um. If I understand correctly, your energy function is the variant of the Dirichlet energy for mapping to a classical group. No? They are uh, from a manifold to a classical group, then I can define. The, 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 the Dirichlet energy? Uh, I'm not familiar with that. Uh, I want to say of the... Uh, of the uh, Henke or... The Henke energy is, a, uh, is the, the geodesic distance. Or, uh, yeah, then there are equivalent. You right? minimize length or minimize the energy. Uh, yeah, okay, of course, of course. Uh, yes, so if we... Um, uh, so if we use this as a, as a strain measure again, so, so um, get back from this uh, new energy function, uh, is the question uh, what we... Uh, I mean, this was just a uh, 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 sentence. I wanted to say that ma many of the, of the problems here in the, in the last slide uh, uh, yes. have a solution uh, in, the, in the theory of uh, the classical theory of the groups. Uh, for example, uh, you're looking at, say, the formula for the uh, uh, yes, of course. Uh, uh, we would. We would uh, really love to do that. The problem is uh, that uh, at uh, at our department uh, we, we know very little about uh, differential geometry and Lie groups, actually. So, if anyone here is uh, familiar with uh, with Lie group theory and um, the geodesic convexity, uh, for example, uh, we would be delighted if you could help us and assist us uh, in some of the computations. Um, but I mean, of course, this uh, might be might be easy. Uh, we haven't really looked into that. Uh, if there's uh, the general theory behind that to simply obtain those uh, those tensors. For the ordinary metric, we have this Cartan formula, and you should adapt it to the case that you have two different ways. Yeah, we would. Uh, two different directions, and then maybe there is some adaptation. We would really like to do that. So, uh, again, if anyone uh, is, is more familiar with that uh, than us, uh, we would also accept help. But, uh, okay, so we, uh, we might like uh, look into that. Uh, okay, thank you. I have also a question. I don't know whether you know, uh, you know just that there is a recent work by Stefan Lukaus and uh, Roman Kodeski where they derive from. The, the Henke energy, or which one? Uh, the energy function. Uh, as an integral of a W. Of oh, so for, uh, the, the general energy. Yes, uh. Yeah, and uh, I, mean, uh, I don't know which kind of W they find and if there is any relation with uh, the theory Okay, but uh, if you could tell me uh, later what uh, yeah. the reference, uh, I would love to look that up. I'm not familiar with it, but uh, it sounds yeah, interesting. I
you could you ask again? Uh, I... If you can generalize it to higher gradient uh, energies. Um, this uh, this new energy function, or uh, yes. I have no idea. Uh, with with higher gradient uh, energies, we haven't worked with that at all. So I'm I'm not familiar with it. I don't know. Uh, I sorry, I can't can't answer that. Um. Okay, so if there are no other questions, we can go.